Okay, maybe then in uh, while we wait for that, why don't we get started to make sure that we have plenty of time since um, this session is a little bit shorter than the other ones. So good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're tuning in from evening. Um, my name is Peter Winsky. I'm in the Slavic Languages and Literatures Department here at USC, and uh, I am chairing this share out session, B2, Reading and Writing. And uh, the way this will work is we have four presenters. Each will have five minutes to um, share a little bit about their views on ungrading and their experience with ungrading. Um, we'll take questions at the end. So each presenter will go in five minute intervals. I will keep time for, for the presenters and I'll send you a, um, a one minute warning in the chat if that's okay um, to just give you a heads up when uh, your, your five minutes are about to end. And then, as I said, if you have questions that you want to make sure that you don't forget, you can put them in the chat for now and we can come back to them at the end, or we'll use the hand raise function at the end and I'll um, I'll have people uh, discuss following that. So mm -hmm. if anyone has any questions, um, we can we can go from there. If not, then maybe we can begin. Our first presenter today is Maria Mercedes Fajas uh, Agudo from the University from USC. Uh, who will be presenting on Unleashing Potential, Transformative Practices, and Student Perspectives on Language Courses. Maria. Thank you. So let me share my presentation. Um, and let's try to do this in five minutes. I think that's going to be a challenging part of this. Okay, so as you said, um, I'm part of the Latin American and Iberian Cultures Department here at USC. I'm a senior lecturer, and the presentation that I'm going to have for you today, it's mostly representing the work I'm doing in, um, whoop, here we go, here we go, in our Spanish 260 Advanced Spanish Arts and Science class. Um, this is a class where we have several objectives for our students. Um, it is a class designed for students that have decided mostly to minor or major in Spanish. Some of them have been part of a basic language program. Some of them come directly from high school after taking AP classes. And one of the objectives we have for the class is that students are going to be able to describe and orate in different time frames using appropriate grammar and vocabulary. And the activity that I'm gonna show, uh, share with you today, it's geared to that objective. Um, the class um, then uh, focuses in developing writing and grammar, so our students are ready to move into higher course levels. We have four pieces of writing that we developed during the semester, a description, an oration, a review, and an argumentative essay that are tied to specific grammar points too. So we kind of encourage them to review grammar and we go from very basic, from present tense and agreement to more sophisticated subjunctive and um, conditional clauses. I'm gonna present an activity that goes into that first piece of writing that we, that we ask them to produce, which is a description. Uh, we use time in the class to talk about, you know, just specifically how to write a description. We talk about how to sophisticate our vocabulary, how to incorporate topographic description, how to describe people, and how to include uh, rhetorical devices into our writing to make it more sophisticated. As I said, we tie this to grammar. Uh, we start with very basic present tense, ser estar, differences and agreements in Spanish, which seems to be very basic and simple, but it always presents challenging uh, for our students. And um, in my case, all written structures have different prompts that we give them. In my case, I asked them to find a picture of themselves and to remember that moment and to write a description of that moment, how they felt, what they were, what they had around them, the people that were involved. That is the prompt that I give them. The, the work that they present is being evaluated with a specific rubric that all the 260 instructors share. Um, it has eight categories, task completion, content and topic developing, organization, creativity and the use of the stylistic devices, the language, the vocabulary, comprehensibility and mechanics. And for each of them, as we review the piece, uh, we give them a yes, it shows proficiency for the level, or no, if it doesn't, then we give them very detailed feedback about how they can improve and do a second rewrite of the piece or third. Uh, in my case, with my classes, I discovered that, you know, we have been talking about terms like uh, agreements and, um, I don't know, use of cero estar. 
and you gave, I gave them that feedback. It turns out that sometimes they came back and they were like, what do you mean by agreement? It's like they know when they have to write that we have to make the noun and the adjective agree, but not all the times I remember that that's how we call it, right? So um, for specifically for all my pieces of writing, right from the beginning of the class, I create um, with the class together with my students, a list of codes that we will apply for all the practice pieces before that last big piece of writing that they have to present, that description. And we make this list together. And for every activity we do that it's a practice of that final description piece that they are gonna submit, they get the form and we use those codes to help each other. Sometimes the codes come from me, sometimes the codes come from other students as we evaluate each other's work. And I ask them afterwards, to look for those errors, for those mistakes, to change them, and then also to give me a little bit of a feedback of why they're changing it. So, you know, you were, you had um, an issue with the adjective and the noun agreement, what should be the correct form, explain why. So they would have say something like, you know, I had a noun that wasn't masculine and um, I have given a masculine singular and it has to be masculine plural. So they have to explain that to me. And when they finish that last big piece of description that they submit uh, for evaluation, formal evaluation, um, I also like them to go back and compare every single piece that they created of description in the class and look for commonalities. Is there a mistake that you are narrow to you have been using for all the pieces? And if there is a mistake like that, why is it happening? Is this something that you can correct? It's just a question of not paying enough attention or if there's a question of really not understanding the topic, in which case, like, let's set up uh, office hour or an appointment and let's talk about that mistake that we are seeing in your writing. Um, so at the end of the semester, we ask for students to give us feedback on the process. You know, we do tell them that we use on grading and we ask them to give us feedback. And um, I isolated to two comments that the students came in. The first one is I really love on grading style of the class. It decreased the stress of a numerical grade. And I can actually try to learn instead of just doing it for a grade. I really like the ability to revise the first few essays because um, it helped me learn from my mistakes. And my favorite one this last semester was this one here. I do feel um, it could be more assignments that are ungraded. Almost all of them gives a chance. Um, I don't, sorry give us a chance to improve, which was really nice. I really enjoyed the grading process. And the last sentence I really love. It was graded, uh, if it was graded, I probably would have turned to translators in order to get my grade up instead of actually trying to learn, which is something that I think it's important. They take ownership of that learning process and they take it, it takes it away of that grade that they want to accomplish and they just go from it. So I think I managed to make it in five minutes. Yes. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maria. Excellent. Okay. And we can, as I mentioned before, we'll come back to questions uh, at the end of uh, the presentations. So uh, our next presenter is Ian Curtis of Kenyon College in Ohio, who will be speaking to us about ungraded process writing in foreign language teaching. And it looks like your screen sharing is working perfectly. Thank you so much. Uh, the time is yours. Okay, thank you, Peter, and uh, thanks to everybody who's helped to organize this. I feel like I'm learning a lot. I'm new to this. Um, so uh, I'm going to share something that's actually very similar to what we just heard, um, that is, as Peter said, about ungraded uh, process writing. So since large language models, uh, LLMs, like ChatGPT became readily available in late 2022, it has become increasingly difficult to detect certain kinds of cheating in language classrooms. There was a time when it was fairly easy to spot use of translation software, first because the programs made all kinds of mistakes, like when I was in high school, I remember this, uh, and later because tools like Google Translate effectively became too good, using grammatical structures and vocabulary that are typically not taught in language classrooms. This at least is my experience uh, in the context of French. ChatGPT, however, however, will not only write your French composition for you, but it can do so while making the occasional mistakes that are typical at a uh, specific language learning level. So I have, and my slideshow is, is very minimal, but I just have a couple of, um, this is an example of a, of a composition that I had translated as well. You can see just some very minor mistakes. Um, <clears throat> when I learned all of this, I found myself worrying less about policing my students' use of these programs 
and more about how students access to chat GPT or certain students access to chat GPT, because maybe that's something we can talk about in the Q&A, but this question of paying for GPT-4, how this would require that I change certain aspects of my teaching. It's easy to prevent students from using technology on graded written work. You do what the French have been doing since the advent of public education. You have them write in-class proctored essays in response to specific prompts. This approach ensures that students have prepared for whatever the assignment is and that no one has a technology-based unfair advantage. It can also make grading fairer, I think, at least in certain cases, since it allows instructors to compare very similar compositions, apples to apples, so to speak. In-class essays have some real drawbacks, though. One, requiring all students to write in response to the same prompt or set of prompts means less room for creativity and originality. Two, this approach can also produce a great deal of stress for students, and this can create equity issues. Students with various uh, mental health issues notably may not perform as well under this kind of pressure. And finally, moving essays in class eliminates the possibility of process writing, which is one of the most important tools that I have used in teaching composition. This share out is, in, my, my, my goal here is to present some strategies that I have developed in my language teaching to continue to use process writing. By ungrading composition drafts while still providing students with both instructor and, uh, and peer feedback and using self-assessment at various stages of the writing process, I was able to disincentivize use of LLMs. I incentivized significant effort on ungraded compositions by incorporating graded in-class essays. I believe the practice of ungrading allowed me to make the whole process creative and also the in-class essays less anxiety inducing. So um, I will uh, elaborate on that just a little bit in the time that I have left. I tested this new approach last semester in two sections of advanced composition and conversation, which is an upper level French course that blends grammar with literature, film and other cultural content and really focuses on composition writing. I had taught the class twice before and each time I used a composition book uh, called Tash Donk, which I like for the way that it helps students draft written work in installments. In the past, I would collect at least one, usually two drafts of each composition, providing feedback and a grade before students submitted their final versions. I also incorporated peer editing and self-editing uh, 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 self activities. Last semester, so this past fall, I opted to keep using, using Tash Donk for this composition book in much the way I had in the past, Students chose their own topics for their compositions and process wrote their essays with my feedback and the feedback from their peers. But this time I didn't grade the compositions, the various installments of the compositions. Instead, at the end of each unit, once each student had already produced a polished composition, I had them write an in-class essay in which they were expected to use all the stylistic techniques and grammar structures they'd been practicing and incorporating into the at-home ungraded compositions. In general, I found that students who appeared to have put a great deal of effort into the ungraded compositions did very well on the in-class uh, essays. I think I also succeeded in avoiding, avoiding those two pitfalls I mentioned earlier, the issue of limiting student creativity uh, and creating unnecessary anxiety. Because students still got to write compositions on subjects of their choosing, they had a lot of freedom and were able to produce writing that was very funny at times, very moving at other times. And as far as anxiety, I think that everyone was okay uh, because they'd had ample practice before going into the in-class essay, they felt prepared. Anecdotally, one student unsolicited came to my office hours after the first in-class essay to tell me that she was initially terrified about having to write on the spot when she saw the syllabus and when we sort of talked about this approach at the beginning of the class, but that by the time the first essay rolled around, she wasn't nervous anymore. I sent out an anonymous uh, survey at midterm also to see how everyone was doing and got some positive comments about ungraded uh, compositions. I have just a, a few examples um, of those here and I will end on that note. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Ian. Um, okay, rolling right along. Uh, our next presenter is Jenny Snow from Fickbird State University in Providence, Rhode Island, who will be speaking to us about re uh, reading journal dialogues in the literature classroom. Excellent. Uh, Jenny, did you manage to get uh, co-host status? I got the co-host status, but I now have a systems preferences error. So I just put the link in the chat. It's a simple Google Doc. I'm going to talk through it. Um, it's not very long, so I think everyone can navigate it. Um, most of it is really to give you, um, well, first of all, let me say thank you for your presentations and thank you for your presence in the audience. Um, 
most of the document is an example of the actual assignment. You can kind of see how I've communicated what I'm talking about with students directly. Um, just in terms of uh, going into it, uh, I'm calling this assignment Reading Journal Dialogues, and it's um, something I do in my literature classes. I do a lot of ungrading practices in my first year writing because it's so process oriented, as Ian was saying. Um, but I wanted to figure out something to bring in a ungrading or, or alternative assessment practice to my literature classes thinking about reading. And I work at a um, state school that works serves primarily first gen and working class students. So there's not a lot of time that students have to sort of engage with literature. Many of these students are also taking it for gen ed credit. So there may be interest, but um, other priorities kind of supersede. So I wanted, my goal with this assignment was to really encourage deeper engagement with literary texts, especially when we're teaching longer ones like novels, um, without creating either more burden on the week and on time with extra homework assignments um, or more grading, which becomes surveillant and sort of uh, punitive when students are already managing a load with other obligations outside of school. And this is fitting in with um, my broader ungrading approach that prioritizes collaboration, meaning sharing also assessment and judgment, um, and prioritizing risk-taking and mistakes, as we've heard a lot today, in terms of that being the essence of learning. And then importantly for me is really going back to relationship building and creating dialogue based on trust. So that's prioritizing kind of two-way feedback. So the assignment is the reading journal dialogue. This is like the second half of the first page, which is really kind of two parts. It's the journal part and the dialogue part. Um, and I like as I said, I have some examples on the next couple of pages of what it actually looks like. Um, but really, I kind of came up with this to do a few things here, bulleted, um, create in-class attention on independent learning that's happening outside of class. So actually giving some time to that when we meet together. Um, it's an assignment that creates ongoing reflection with multiple pause points throughout the semester. And that's important. Um, I have figured out in terms of thinking about 15 weeks with different inflection points where students have different cycles and waves of, of things beyond what is actually happening in the 15 weeks that I've designed. Um, this assignment is also a bridge between sort of the reading and discussion parts of the class and the writing parts of the class um, with a sort of general education mindset. Students are bringing all kinds of expertise and backgrounds and interests and confidence levels with all of those skills that are engaged. So this is intentional to kind of create some bridge between them. It's also a way of introducing student-driven assessment that also incorporates individual goals that they're setting and sort of keeping track of um, in conversation with me, um, which is the last point to kind of um, establishing this shared habit of two-way feedback. So that's a component as well. So the first image here is um, the sort of journal assignment that I give at the beginning of the semester and is sort of the um, implicit structure for the whole semester. Um, I make suggestions essentially of what active reading is according to me um, and sort of say, you know, I would suggest that you react to texts and ideas, ask questions, make connections. And I sort of break down what that looks like. Um, and But I don't have any other requirements about what actually is going into the journal. And indeed, I don't collect the journal and I don't grade the journal. Um, so it's really a space for students to be reading on their own in a way that they do that and whatever that looks like. Um, and then I also invite them to sort of use it in class. And sometimes we'll refer to it in discussion um, or to log their notes from class in that same space. Um, so this is page two now. Um, so that journal is just sort of theirs. Um, I'm not checking it or sort of collecting it. Um, and we have these dialogue days that I've included a sampling of the questions where we take 20 minutes or so. Students are invited with prompts to kind of go back and look at their, their notes and their learning um, and articulate to me some of the things they've learned, some of the sort of things they've worked on, as well as things that have helped their learning and things that are not working so well. I've included some other questions there that kind of show um, how to make connections to other assignments and start to really um, engage with the self-assessment process 
The last page is just sort of what it looks like at the very end of the semester um, with sort of emphasis on what is your learning overall? How do you look back at the whole multiple pause points we've uh, done, sort of prompting the sort of course objectives that come from, from me and from the university, and then allowing students to fully self-assess that portion of the grade through multiple criteria. Okay, I'll stop there. I'm over time and I'll pass it off. I'm happy to talk more about this soon. Thank you guys. Oh, thank you so much, Jenny. Perfect timing. Absolutely perfect. Wonderful. Um, okay. And now our final presenter for today is Nushan Ashtari uh, from University of Southern California, who will be speaking to us about self-selected pleasure reading and self-selected selected pleasure note-taking. Uh, so Nushan, please. Thank you so much. I am trying to share oh. my screen. It doesn't. Okay. Yeah. So real quick, leave the breakout room and come back in, and then you should be assigned as a co-host, hopefully. Okay. I'll be back. <laughs> Bye. Uh, Okay, well, uh, while we're waiting for Nushan, um, just I think if maybe um, we won't take any questions at the moment, but if people have anything they want to like formulate quickly and maybe could could um, type out, that would be that would be helpful. But again, I want to thank all of the presenters so far for perfect timing and, and wonderful uh, sessions. Uh, presenting material in five minutes can be so difficult, and everyone has given such wonderful um, presentations so far. So let's see. Is Nushan back? Maybe while we're waiting, does anyone have a have a quick question that when we can start start now and I can keep time on that? Oh, Nushan's back. Okay. Are you are you a co-host now? Um last time I came back in, I couldn't share, but now I can share. So that's good. Okay. Go for it. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> All right. Hello, hello, everyone. So glad to see um, everyone. And thank you for organizing this conference. So today I am going to talk about self-selected pleasure reading and self-selected pleasure note taking. My name is Nushan Ashtari. Um, and one of the quotes that I really love is by Dr. Frank Smith, who was a psycholinguist, and he said that in general, us humans, and in particular students, we have three states of mind. We're either learning, we are bored, or we're confused. And in his research, he said that a lot of the traditional learning environments and educational systems that we have available are a combination of the last two, unfortunately, boredom and confusion. However, when it comes to true learning, students and us in general, humans are really interested in the topics and the lessons. We're excited to see our own growth and learning. So those are the things that I really like to see my students and myself go through. And when it comes to languages, um, we have a similar concept when we talk about language acquisition versus language learning. As we know, Dr. Krashen brought it forth that language learning is more of the studying of language and grammar points and tests and a lot of grading and memorizing things. Versus when it comes to language acquisition, it's more of a subconscious process of us understanding messages that we hear and messages that we read. And reading in general, several research studies have consistently shown that it's a great, great tool that we have, in particular when it comes to pleasure reading, reading things that we are interested in reading that not only help with our reading skills, but also with acquisition of vocabulary, spelling, and grammar. So it's a great, great tool for us to use. Now, the two tools that I would like us um, to think about are self-selected pleasure reading, which is just giving the students a few minutes of a class time to read any topic, any text of their own choice. Um, and self-selected pleasure note taking is that they can write anything about the text they're reading. They can comment on anything. They ha can have any thoughts. They can even draw anything that they want as they're comprehending the text and as they're interacting with the reading materials. And again, these are only a few minutes after the class time and um, or I mean, by the end of the class time or any time during uh, the class time that you can give the students to just read anything that they want and see their comprehension. Now, some research about the um, reasons why reading can be, and pleasure reading can be very effective. Uh, I'm not going to go through details or many of the studies, but a couple of them, for example, Rose and Rogers, they were showing that 
if we read 1 million words of science, fic science fiction, which would be one year of pleasure reading, that is actually 92% of 318 science words in the academic word list. And nearly half of them are repeated more than 10 times, which again, for language acquisition, we need, do need that multiple exposure to the content. Matt Quillen also looked at 22 popular novels, and the research showed that 85% of words included in the academic word list were included in those novels. And if we read seven, I don't know if there are any Harry Potter fans here, I definitely am one. Uh, if someone reads seven Harry Potter novels, that is one-fifth to one-half of the word uh, words on the academic word list as well. So it's not just reading a story, you're acquiring all these other uh, skills and other knowledge as well. Also, by having a uh, self-selected pleasure reading, we're also providing optimal input for our students. Krashen and Mason talk about optimal input that has four characteristics. It's comprehensible, meaning that the readers can understand the text for the most part. They're compelling, mean that, meaning that they're very interested in the topic so that it gives them that flow of being in the story, being in the context, being um, in the reading. Rich, meaning that they provide a lot of contextualized knowledge for them. And abundant, meaning that they have multiple exposure to the language so that they can acquire, di acquire different aspects of the language. So in general, it's a win-win situation and they're ungraded. So that that's, those could be some options that we can look into. To. With that being said, here is a list of my selected references, and thank you all so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, 